Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good evening. My name is Cindy, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Cold up here. Great to be here. Before I start, I want to thank the people that gave me the opportunity to come up here and do service work because that's what this is. It's an honor to serve Alcoholics Anonymous. Alcoholics Anonymous has been serving me for many days now. And if I could just simply give back a tenth of what I've gotten before I die, then I'll be happy. One thing I've learned in AA that I didn't know I had years and years ago, and that's choices. And I can make choices now, so I'm going to offer you two choices tonight before I start. The first choice is I can give you my story nice and white, fluffy, or I can give it to you down and dirty. How do you want it? If I'd had to guess. (laughs) All right. Well, it will probably offend a few before the night's over with, but that's what the, uh, that's what our sponsors are for, right? Yeah. Take what you want and leave the rest, okay? Told me a long time ago, there's nothing pretty about a drunk. Could have fooled me. I thought I was beautiful. I can't tell you how much time I spent in the girls' room checking my makeup, looking at my hair, and forgetting that my skirt was tucked in the back of my pantyhose. (laughs) But I was beautiful. (laughs) I tell you, I was a legend in my own mind. Some things never change. (laughs) Well, I tell you, I'll start here. I was born a long time ago at a very early age. (laughs) Took two people to make me. One was a man, one was a woman. Is any of this news? I was born into a family of two wonderful people, only they didn't know it. So they drank because they believed they weren't. I had a dad who was a steel worker, great big Irishman, and he had the sickest parents in the world. They named him Faye. Now, (laughs) six foot, 230 pounds, red hair, and your name is Faye? I'd drink, too. He probably got the living daylights knocked out of him when he was a kid. But he was a great guy, only he didn't know it. My mother was a fantastic woman, and she didn't know it. They had eight of us. There's a few of us left. (laughs) They were hardworking, clean individuals. Got married young, 16, 18 years old. Didn't know anything. They know how to breed like rabbit. They know how to fight like dogs. And knew how to drink like fish. Now, you know what? Fish don't drink. They drowned. Why do we say we drink like fish? I drank like a pig. (laughs) No, I didn't. I really didn't drink like a pig. I drank like a man, I acted like a slut, and I got mad if you didn't respect me and treat me like a lady. Yeah. (laughs) But my folks were good people. 
Monday through Friday, I had the nicest parents in the world. They were workaholics. You know, if you started something, you finished it. I don't care if you started at 10 o'clock at night, you stayed up till 4 till it was done. The house looked like better homes and gardens on the outside. It looked like Mr. Clean lived there on the inside. Nothing was out of place. Everything was perfect until the paycheck got in Dad's pocket on a Friday night. My dad drank. I could, I never, I'll never forget it. He picked up a, a case of Genesee and he called that beer. Uh, a case of Genesee, a gallon of Gallo Tawny Port, and a quart of Seagram's Yellow Gin, and then they bought groceries. Four cartons of cigarettes, and whatever was left, we ate. They fought like cats and dogs. My dad turned into an absolute monster when he drank. The most wonderful man in the world disappeared. And inevitably, before the night was over with, there was going to be a black guy, blood on the wall, broken furniture, and children crying. And it was that way every weekend of my entire life. So, of course, at some point in time around in there, at the age of four, I was introduced to sex. And that's sad. But I took full advantage of that. By the time I was eight years old, I had my first sexual relationship that I chose. And this will tell you a little bit about my story. It was with a set of twins, Wayne and Elaine. Think about that one. <laughs> Told you I'm going to make a few of you upset. Hang on to your seat, honey. We ain't done yet. So kids aren't supposed to be having sex at that age, and I know that, but when you're introduced to it at a young age, which you're not supposed to have that happen, it does. Life is life, and I've come to understand that, okay? So even though things aren't right and things aren't perfect, things are real, aren't they? And if we don't get real in Alcoholic Anonymous, we're not going to get sober, are we? And they told me I was as sick as my secrets, so I can't have any secrets anymore, because I choose today not to be sick. Well, my life continued, and I started out my life with a big heartbreak, because it, when I started kindergarten, I had a very embarrassing situation. I peed my pants as a little kid, and I was shamed by my kindergarten teacher, which taught me real quick, don't you dare ask for anything, because I raised my hand, and she wouldn't let me go. So I learned real quick not to ask. And I learned real quick what it was like to be embarrassed and feel different than all the other kids in the class. And I carried that up through the years. Well, come first grade, you know how they'll sit you all around those little oak chairs and they'll ask all the kids, what do you want to be when you grow up? Well, they're asking all the little Jimmies and Johnnies and Susies and Marys because that's what the names were back in my day. And the little boys wanted to be truck drivers and doctors and firemen and farmers. And the little girls wanted to be mommies and nurses and school teachers. Well, when they got to me, I raised my hand. I couldn't wait. I was so excited because I knew I wanted to be something nobody had come up with. So when it comes to me, I raised my hand. I jumped on my chair and she said, well, Cindy, what do you want to be when you grow up? I said, I want to be a priest. <laughs> well, you know... That really was my heart's desire. I was raised Catholic. And that teacher stood there and she said, Oh, Cindy, sweetheart, no, 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 you can't. Don't you understand? And I said, Well, I can so and I will. And she said, No, dear, you won't. She said, Don't you understand? She says, God doesn't talk to little girls. God only talks to little boys. You never see female priests, have you? Well, you know, I knew she was wrong, but I bought what she said. So I didn't want to do with religion the rest of my life, I tell you. I was done right then and there. And you can take your God and put it where the sun doesn't shine. Because I didn't want to do with it, because God wasn't going to talk to me. Well, I had a clue for her, and I didn't tell her this. I had already had a conversation with God. 
You know, us little kids do that when we're lying in our bed scared to death to get out. We do a lot of praying long before we come to Alcoholics Anonymous, but I think we forget that. So as years went on, you know, I ended up getting married. I ended up getting pregnant when I was 16. And I know there's a little gal right down here in the audience that's sitting right down here in the front. And this is her first day of sobriety. Congratulations, sweetheart. I got to tell you, when I was 16, I got pregnant. You know how women, gals, you know, you know this, guys, you don't know much about this stuff. But ladies, you know how we're always saying we lost our virginity? Well, I never lost mine. Mine's 38 years old. His name is Mark, and he lives in New York. I know where mine is. Uh Uh-huh. Now, that's the way I started. Well, my husband and I did just what my mother and father did. We worked hard Friday and Saturday night. We got drunk and fought just like they did. Okay? Well, we divorced after we were married about five years. I had two children. And then we divorced. And uh, I went on my merry way. And my husband went on his merry way. And I started to drink. And I drank real heavy. I was the first person... In my family, in generation, I mean, no one divorced. I was the first one to divorce. And that was big in my family. Even though my husband beat me up, my mother would say to me, what you want to do, honey, is you got to know there's two things going to happen when you get married. Your husband's going to cheat on you, and he's going to beat you up and get used to it. And those were my mother's words for me when I got married. Well, you know, they were true. I didn't know it at the time. And she, of course, thought it was everybody that did that. And, of course, everybody doesn't do that, and I know that today. But that's what happened in my marriage. Well, my drinking continued after my husband and I separated. In fact, in 1972, my early 20s, I got two DWIs in 30 days. But I didn't have a drinking problem. I just got caught. You know that one, don't you? I can tell you one of the most incredible sounds that I ever had in my ears was when that jail cell door closed. It's an awful feeling. It's an awful sound. And I don't look good in gray. They put me in a gray prison dress, and they put a number in front of me, and they did that whole deal like you see on the TV. And I thought, my God, this is ridiculous. All I did was have a few drinks. But back then, that's what they did. They put you in a Wampsville jail. They closed that door, and I looked over, and there was a a toilet with no top on it, and there was a bed that was a board, and it was suspended by four chains from the ceiling with a pad on it. Not pretty. (laughs) <laughs> and so I, I'm, I try to find the humor in everything I can find in any bad situation or any good situation because I want to tell you one thing. If you take one thing out of here tonight that I say, if I would want you to remember anything at all, I would want you to remember that nothing happens to me. Everything happens for me with no exceptions to the rule whatsoever from the day I entered this earth. And I know that to the core of my soul. So when I'm standing there in this cell and I'm thinking, well, I wonder who's here with me. God, this could be kind of exciting. So I try to peek around the bars and I say, hey, anybody over there? The woman says, I'm over here. I says, I remember Lucille Ball, one of her shows, and then she got in the jail for something. And I said, hey, what you in for? <laughs> she says, killing a cop. I sat down and was real quiet. So I got out of my first DWI with a muffler. Isn't that what money can do for you? Isn't it incredible? And then my second one, I fell asleep on Interstate 81. I think I fell asleep. I probably passed out, but I said I fell asleep. Hit another car with four people in it. We locked bumpers, and and, uh, finally we got over to the side of the road. But I got, uh, I didn't get in jail for that one, but I lost my license on that one. And that one they told me I was an alcoholic, and that made me mad. Because I knew I wasn't an alcoholic. I knew I drank heavy. I strive for that. <laughs> that was my whole idea, to drink more than anybody else I knew. My whole idea was to be able to consume as much alcohol as I could and still drive 110 miles an hour. And I did. 
I had only had one speed in my car. I, t I don't know why I'm alive. I did not know how to drive my car without driving it wide open. I was an absolute maniac behind the wheel of a car. I was an absolute maniac if I wasn't behind the wheel of a car. <laughs> So I went to work that night, and I told the guys I was the only woman there. I drove, I loaded tractor trailers for a living. Isn't that pretty? Well, what it was, it wasn't pretty, but what it did do is it gave me my first union job, and I made good money for the first time in my life. And I had two little kids I was raising by myself, so this was real good. So I went to work that night, and the guy said, how'd you do with your DWI? And I said, well, I got out of that one again, too. That's great. Let's celebrate. Yeah. Next morning, took me out at 8 o'clock. We worked the midnight to 8 o'clock shift because there was a tavern out back. And I worked for Seal Test Ice Cream, and it was 34 below zero in the freezer. And we would take turns sneaking out back. We'd go over three, four at a time, drink, come back. When, you know, the other one we'd watch. And then we'd take turns getting up three, three high on these pallets of ice cream, and we'd sleep. You put cardboard up there at 34 below zero, and you can go to sleep. But you got to have the people remember to come wake you up. <laughs> so you don't freeze to death. Yeah. Well, then I started to get real sick, and the doctors told me, Cindy, you're going to have to stop drinking. And I said, no, we're going to have to find another way. I mean, I, alcoholism, alcoholic drinking, for me, was a learned behavior. My parents taught me well. They did not mean to. But, you know, I never heard a thing my parents said, but I watched everything they did because their actions spoke much louder than their words. And when they thought the kids weren't looking, that's when we were looking the most. That's when we were paying the closest attention, when they thought we were sleeping. So I learned. I learned a lot. And I learned that the one in my family that had the most fun was my dad. He was gone all weekend. He was partying. and he'd come home and he'd tell his stories and he'd have a ball. And mom sat there and raised us kids. Now, whether my, my father was an alcoholic, I don't know. But I know he was one hell of a heavy drinker. He never went into AA. He drank himself to death at 54. So my guess is he probably was an alcoholic. All my brothers drink heavy, but none of them do today. They're not alcoholics. But, you know, I cross some kind of an invisible line, and I don't know when and I don't know where. And I crossed over into this land of never, never land. And I, when I say never, never, I mean I can't ever get back to being a social drinker, and I know that. I lose absolutely total control now. And I didn't. For years, I drank, and I had a ball. And I do not regret my past. And I do not close the door on it. But I do know today, if I know nothing more, that I am powerless over alcohol. And I do know today that if I ask God to do for me what I cannot do for myself, it is done, and it is done instantly. See, when I came in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, I came in with your God, and it didn't fit for me. And they told me, Cindy, if you don't get a God, you're not going to stay sober. And I said, but I don't like your God. Your God is mean. Your God did not protect me when I was a little girl. Your God did not keep my father from beating me up. Your God did not keep me from my husband beating me up. Your God didn't keep me from being raped. Your God didn't keep me from the visitations in my bed as a child that I did not ask for. And they said, well, then make your own God. Quit bitching. <laughs> well, <laughs> you mean I can have my own God? Is that a God of your understanding, not our understanding? Because, see, we all understand our own God. And my God might not be your God. And your God might not be my God, and by God, that's okay. By God, that is okay. So I got me a God, and it's a dandy. 
See, my God doesn't care what I do. My God could care less what I do. But what my God is wants me to care about what I do. Because I'll be given free reign to do anything and everything I want. So I'm not punished by my sins or for my sins. I'm punished by them. And I know that today. And some people call it karma. Some people say what goes around comes around. And boy, if you've got any amount of sobriety at all, you know it come right behind you and bitch in the ass, didn't it? Aren't we a little more careful about how we treat people today? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I know that I am. And I know I don't do it because I don't want bad things to happen. I am a decent person today because I want to be. Okay? I no longer ride on the hood of my car, hanging onto my windshield wipers while somebody's driving at 90 miles an hour with a quarter Lambrusco between my legs. That's crazy. <laughs> and I used to think that was a good time. And it was, I suppose, when you're in that state of mind. <laughs> you wouldn't catch me doing that day because I get my pants dirty. <laughs> See, one of those character defects I still got is called vanity. You know. <laughs> so please, let's make sure that chair is clean if I'm going to sit on it, okay? <laughs> and I didn't know I was supposed to wear a snowsuit up here. I thought I was in Arizona. <laughs> See, I'm a New York girl. I've only been here about a year and a half. I came in from New York. I'm a transplant. I'm one of those people that come in and crowd this beautiful state up, you know? You poor people that were born here, you probably hate us, huh? God. Well, you know what? Talk to your sponsor about it. Go to a meeting. You'll get over it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ain't great. But this is a beautiful state you got here, and I absolutely love it. But I got to tell you, when I moved here a year, year and a half ago, I left a lot of sobriety, and I left my family back east. And and uh, the last year of my life, I think, has been one of the hardest years of my life ever because I didn't have my AA family. I can go back and you know, I can call my, my, uh, my, my biological family, which I miss and I love, and they're all back east. I have no relatives here. But getting reconnected into AA was hard for me. And, you know, and I don't really know why other than, uh, well, probably because I don't know how to use the phone and I don't ask for help. I wonder, does anybody else do that out there? Yeah, 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 you know. So, yeah, I can sit in the corner and read the big book and never have to ask for any help and wonder why my life hurts. <laughs> it hurts. But, you know, I did. I come here, and I, and, I, and I struggled to find a meeting, and I finally found a meeting in Scottsdale, and I love it in Scottsdale, I tell you. But I, I know one thing right now that I could have never drank here because I had to hang on to the grass in New York so I wouldn't fall off the earth when I was drunk. And, hell, can you imagine digging in the sand here? Where are you going? But I did. I finally got me. I found me a group here called the No Sniveling. In, uh, in Scottsdale, the no sniveling, and they're a wonderful bunch of people, a very diverse group of people. And I go to a, I go to a 7 a.m. meeting, because I tell you, I need, I need to have my attitude adjusted the minute I get out of bed, because I have got, I have got an awful thing between my ears, and it's called my brain. And I tell you, it's, it's, it's still very alcoholic. You know, I think my body, what they say here, your, your, your liver will get clean of alcohol after five years. And I don't think my brain's ever going to stop thinking like an alcoholic. My actions change, which will help me change my thinking. But I don't think my, my, my thinking, for some reason, it's a, I think it's a done deal. And uh, so I accept the fact that I'm an alcoholic and my thinking is alcoholic. So I'm one of these people that, that I, I do need a morning meeting. And I'm a meeting doer. Okay, I've been uh, sober a few 24 hours, and I do uh, I do at least uh, seven meetings a week. And people will say to me, "My God, what's the matter with you? You still need that kind of meeting?" Well, I'm sick, <laughs> you know. But I love my meetings. I love the people in the meetings. And when I first started, you know, I can remember going into day when I first got in there and thinking, "Well, I'll get sober and I won't drink, but I'm not going to have a damn thing to do with you jerks," you know. 
I mean, my God, you know, talk judgmental. Hmm. You know, I'd look at your clothing. I, and then I would sit there and you could tell you probably none of you would have ever experienced this, but I would sit in a meeting and I could, when the, someone would raise their hand, cause that's how we do it up in Syracuse, New York. And I'd say, I know what, what they're going to say. They say the same shit every time. But you got, you guys never thought about that or did in it, did you? No, no. Okay, okay. All right. Well, I know it's just me because I'm terminal and you know, I'm unique. You know that, don't you? So I know I'm the only one that thinks like that. But I got established in a great meeting here. But I tell you, I would not be alive today if it was not for Alcoholics Anonymous. I would not be happy, joyous, and free if it was not for my God and the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. I stay in AA through the third tradition because, you know, this was the only place I couldn't get thrown out of. No matter what I said or what I did, you could get mad at me, and then I'd just say, go talk to your sponsor, go to a meeting. I don't care. I'm not up for debate. (laughs) I'm about as imperfectly perfect as you're going to get. And that's okay today. That is absolutely okay. I know that everybody's not going to like me. If you did, you need more than a sponsor in a meeting, I'm telling you. You better go get yourself a whole lot of help. But they did set up a bunch of things, and one was called Principles Before Personalities. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. And it's the only reason why we're all standing here freezing our butts off, because that you know there's a lot of folks here maybe you don't like. But that's okay. And what, what, what I have learned is if I don't like somebody, that's the person I need to gravitate to real quick. Because they told me a long time ago, if you spot it, you got it. Yeah. And, you know, one of the hardest things I had to do in a meeting one day is a gentleman came in, and God bless him, talk about as sick as your secrets. He sat right there, and he talked about how he was in a relationship with a woman, and she let him babysit, and that was great, but she knew at one time he was a child molester. Well, you know, that was a tough one for me to swallow. So what I had to do after that meeting, when it was time to go do the Lord's Prayer, I had to cross the room and hold that man's hand. Because that's what Ahe has taught me, is to forgive. I don't know anything about anybody but me. And I'm not going to gain the thing if I judge anybody. And I tell you, if I have done something wrong... You can bet that I'm going to stand before you and hope and pray you're going to forgive me and that you'll have mercy for me. So I damn well better be able to hand that right back to you when you stand in front of me. So that taught me a good lesson. So I know today that all walks of life walk into Alcoholics Anonymous. And there's nothing that will drive me nuts more than have somebody sit there and say in a meeting, I wish you wouldn't swear. (laughs) Now, we're a bunch of drunks. We lived in bar rooms. We didn't even know where underwear was when we got home. (laughs) And we're not going to (laughs) swear? No, I, and, I, and, I, and I don't, you know, I don't, I don't advocate a lot of swearing. I think a little bit of swearing is fun. It feels good, doesn't it? But, but, but I get a kick out of that when somebody else says, "I really wish you wouldn't swear." This is my church, you know. Well, AA is my religion. It most certainly is. I, um, I, I'm not one for doing. I'm not one at all for doing. Um, what they call, uh, what do they call that? That religion they create, all those different things. I'm recovering Catholic. And, uh, and, and I mean that heart and soul. Uh, because I do have a God and I do have a God of my understanding. And that, I tell you that God has saved me. I tell you a little story. Uh, I was sober. I do things a little bit backwards. I don't know if you ever did that. You know, I got pregnant before I got married. You know, I went to rehab after I was sober a year and a half. You know, <laughs> I get things turned around. <laughs> but after I was um, after I was sober about four years, uh, 
I got uh, an, an, an excellent, an absolute excellent uh, experience of what the fellowship of AA is like and how wonderful you people are. See, now, uh, when my husband and I were married, we had two children. We had a boy, and then we had a girl. And I don't know if you've ever heard the expression, the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree. Well, my daughter was a split image of her mother. I mean, she was an absolute hell raiser. I was a, 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 a bar goer. I loved the smell of puke, urine, and dirty ashtrays. <laughs> I'd go out and spend four hundred dollars on my outfit so I could be there, but <laughs> you know. But uh, there was just something about the bar that drew me. Something about laying on a pool table, I guess, it just felt good on my back. <laughs> oh, oh my God! <laughs> Those are the days, you know. What can I say? The truth is the truth. Ah, uh, but I got a little sidetracked here. But what I wanted to tell you was that, <laughs> oh, God. Uh, I had two beautiful children, and uh, and they did just with their mom. Well, my boy didn't too bad. My boy, he's a cop. He had to get control somewhere, didn't he? Poor thing. <laughs> uh but my daughter, she was a, a little bit out of control, just a little bit. And uh, uh, Lan was a tall gal. She was about 5'9", blonde hair, and she did some modeling on the side. And, and uh, she had a, a mouth like a truck driver, just like her mother. And, uh, and uh, she was a real pretty gal, and, and she had a gorgeous body, and she used it. And uh, and that's what I was taught, and that's what I did. I mean, hell, you know, gals, we can go out broke and come home with money in our pocket. How the hell did that happen? Uh, and all we did was drink all night, we think. But hell, I only had a few. <laughs> few what? <laughs> oh, my goodness gracious. But anyway, get back to my story here. I digress a little bit. Uh, it was a, um, it was December. In 1993, I'd been sober, got sober December uh, 5th, a few years back. But this was 1993, December 17th, and um, it was about 11.30 at night. I got a phone call. This is my daughter. She was crying. We do that when we get drunk, don't we? Aren't we pathetic? Well, anyway, she had a little incident. She'd gone out with her friends, and with one of her girlfriends, she'd left a note for her boyfriend, and she, uh, he didn't like that. He was a jealous fellow. She was quite a looker, so, but he was a jealous fellow. And he went to the bar where she was, and you know how we'll do this, guys. We get a little upset, and we get afraid when there's something that we got the most we love. We're afraid we're going to lose it, so we hurt it. And he grabbed her by the hair of the head, and he pulled her off that bar stool, and drug her out in the parking lot, and slapped her around in front of her friends, and Boy, she felt terrible. She gave me a call that night. She's crying her eyes out. And, Mom, why does Tim hit me? And I said, Honey, I don't know. I don't know. Why do we hit each other when we get drunk? Damn it. And uh, I said, What matters now is the only thing you need to do, sweetheart, get yourself in a safe place. Get yourself a safe place now because Tim doesn't know what he's doing. He knows he loves you, but he doesn't know what to do with that love. He's afraid. And isn't that what we do? We, we run around in fear and we hurt the things we love the most. Well, she was absolutely humiliated, and so she continued her drinking. She went on home back to her apartment, and she promised me she'd get herself in a safe place. She did. Four o'clock that morning, I got that knock on the door that none of us ever want to get. And my daughter shot and killed herself. Now, I tell you, for anybody here that's new in this crowd tonight, and you think for one second, that AA doesn't work, it's because you're not working it. And don't you ever blame AA for your drunkenness, ever. It was Alcoholics Anonymous. It was the people in Alcoholics Anonymous that came to my daughter's funeral, and some of them came there, and they didn't even know me. They were just, you know how you'll stand there at the casket, and you just wait for people to come up, and and you just uh, you just, you just just do what you got to do, because that's what we do as drunks, don't we? 
we can get our shit together in a heartbeat. And um, as you stand there, and uh, people would come up to me, and they literally, literally hug the hell out of me. That's what people in AA do. They take you in their arms. And you know, every time somebody would come up and they would hug me and they would take me in their arms, when they left and walked away, they took just a little bit of my pain with them. And I know that today. I did not pick up a drink. I didn't take a tranquilizer. And I don't tell you that to impress you. I tell you that to impress upon you that there is no reason whatsoever to pick up a drink today. Not any. uh, Alcoholics Anonymous taught me I had a choice there. I could have picked up a drink. I mean, what's a better time to say, oh, poor me. Oh, my God, I can't take it. I can't stand it. You're right, I couldn't take it. I couldn't stand it. I laid down. I pulled my hair. I screamed. I yelled for months. But I did not. I did not pick up a drink or a drug or another human being. Because that's part of my story, too. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of different ways I cannot want to feel what's going on in my body. But I had learned in AA that if I didn't go through the grief of my daughter's death, that it would go through me. And you know, if I go through it, I'm going to be okay. If it goes through me, it's going to rip me wide open a lot worse. So I had some choices to make. And I stayed sober. And I went to meeting. And I can remember being in a Saturday morning women's meeting. I think it was about three months after Leanne had made that decision to take her life. And I still say that nothing happens to me. Everything happens for me. That I sat there in that meeting, the Saturday morning meeting, a woman came in and she, they asked for a topic up in Syracuse. She raised her hand and she said, I got a topic. And the chairperson said, what's that? She says, I just want to kill my daughter. Now, she said that in jest and in anger, but I tell you, that clicked inside me, and I started crying, and I couldn't stop. I cried so hard, I slid out of the chair on the floor. And do you know what my sisters did? They got out of their chairs and laid on the floor with me. That's Alcoholics Anonymous, folks. My own family couldn't hold me. When I called my whole family that morning to come up and told them what had happened, they walked into my kitchen and they all stood back. And my mother said to me, are you coming home at Christmas? And I said, I don't know. And she says, don't worry, honey. Come on home. We won't talk about it. And I said, if I come home, if I can't talk about it, I'm not coming home. My AA family took care of me then and they take care of me now now four years later my closest sister who is my older sister shot and killed herself my father killed himself I have six generations of suicide alcoholism that I know of I don't want to kill myself anymore. But you know, when I was driving my car wide open, that's what was going on in my mind, and you know it as well as I do, don't you? We just want to stop hurting. We just don't want to deal with the truth. Well, you know, everything I have done, and I tell you, I could stand up here and curl your hair, and I won't, and I know that's disappointing a few of you, That's what my sponsor's for, right? And if you don't have one, get one. You know, just get one, damn it. Hurry up. It's for you, not to you. The fourth step is the most incredible, wonderful step in this program next to the third. And the third is turn your will and your life. 
not the second and a half step or the third and a half step, but the third step. Turn your will and your life over to the care of God because I guarantee you God's got a much better plan for you than you have. So let him do his work. Get out of the way. Now, that, you know, when I saw the promises on the wall in AA, I'm very greedy and I'm very selfish and I'm very self-centered and I'm very arrogant. So I said, I saw them as gifts and I said, I'm hanging around. Economic insecurity? Love that one. That must mean I'm going to be rich. I mean, we do interpret things the way we want to, don't we? I picked my first sponsor because he drove a plane. (laughs) I don't know what he said. I never listened. I just wanted to get rich. (laughs) And it's beyond my wildest dreams. Well, my dreams were pretty wild when I came in here. They're a whole lot different now. And I tell you, God has given me a life that I could not have asked for because I didn't know I needed what I have today. And I don't know if I'm going to die a rich woman, and I don't know if I'm going to die with my arms, my legs. I know I don't have any of my insides left. You know, they told me that way back there back when I was 28 years old, and they, they told me I better quit drinking. And I said, no, I think that's all right. I'll just keep right on drinking. We'll just take some more medication. Well, they ended up costing me two-thirds of my inside. And they took it all out from me. Now, my, don- my donor card's got all these scratch marks on it. <laughs> I ain't got much to give. <laughs> and what's left isn't very pretty. <laughs> Somebody asked me if I had a tattoo, and I said, My God, why wouldn't I going to get a tattoo? For Pete's sake, if I had a heart, it would be about this long now. The way things hang and droop at my age. My God. (laughs) Think about that, ladies, before you get a tattoo, okay? (laughs) I thought I lost weight, so I turned and looked at it all hand behind my knees. (laughs) So I don't know what you want to do with your life, but I know what I want to do with mine. And I want to stay sober. And I strive today to become a woman of dignity and honor. And I stand before you and I mean that. You know, I didn't know what it was to be faithful in the relationship. And, of course, I know none of you have ever experienced that. But uh, <laughs> it's something I strive for. It's something I beg for in the sixth and seventh step to take the hunt out of me because I was a hunter. Because if you wanted me, then I knew I was okay. Remember I told you I was a legend in my own mind, and believe me, if you hadn't had Cindy, you hadn't lived. Is that sick or what? Yeah. And I didn't care whether you were the mister or the missus. didn't bother me, because after all, I was walking, talking best, you know? Isn't that ridiculous? So I've learned some values here in AA come out of my fourth and fifth and sixth and seventh step. And then in my eighth step when I had to write down and realize all the people that I had harmed. And then I had to go face to face and that's the tough one. But that's the one that really cleans up the back steps, doesn't it? When you go in there and you say, I'm sorry, but you better be darn sure that when you say you're sorry, you're going to follow that up with an action because... An apology without action is a lie. And today I get to do my 10th step. So when I get done here tonight, if anybody here thinks I owe them a 10th step, come tell me we can talk about it. Because my intention today is not to offend and not to be mean. But it wasn't that way always. And I practice my 11th step diligently. You know, it took me eight years in AA to get on my knees. Didn't take me that long in the bar room. What the hell is that about? (laughs) Go figure. Can you figure that one out? I don't understand that. Eight years of sobriety, I got on my knees. It made a difference. Talk about, you want instant gratification? You get on your knees and ask for what you want. 
I'm telling you, it's instant. And then I do my 12 step. I do my 12 step every time I go to a meeting. Anytime I participate in anything to do with Alcoholics Anonymous, I'm doing my 12 step. So I know you're out there freezing your buns off, and I tell you, I really appreciate y'all sitting here tonight, giving me the opportunity to stand before you, a changed woman. I am not the woman, although you probably would have thought it was a whole lot more fun before. They told me that the softest pillow is a clean conscience. I sleep pretty good today. So your money's safe tonight. Your cars are safe. Your husband's safe. Your wife is safe. You're all safe tonight. (laughs) I'm of absolutely no danger. I used to be the one your mother warned you about. I'm no longer that person. Okay? Today, if you come up and hug me, you know I'm hugging you because... I love you, not because I want to make love to you. A whole big difference here today. AA has taught me how to love people outside the bedroom. Isn't that incredible? What a concept. I can actually fall in love with someone today just by hearing what they say. Because I know their struggle because I've been there. And that's a whole, this whole being in love thing is a whole different ball game for me today. So if you if you got it somewhere in your head that this is not working for you, then sit down and talk to somebody because it is not AA, it's you. You just aren't getting it because you aren't looking at something. And my guess would be you're not looking at you. You're busy looking at me. This is not easy. You people are the chosen people. You really are. You know, AA, they'll tell us AA is not for, it is for, for, for everybody, but not everybody wants it. And those that are you are here tonight, you want this or you wouldn't be freezing your ass off. Right? Yes, and it's yours. It's yours while you're here, but it's even yours once you leave. And the beautiful part of it is that it's yours to give away. Because if you're going to take it home and lock it up, it's going to rot. You got to, this is one of those things you just got to keep paying it forward. You pay it forward and pay it forward and it's just going to get bigger and better and more beautiful beyond your wildest dreams. I guarantee it. I make you that promise as I stand here. And that's pretty damn arrogant, isn't it? But I told you I was that way. So I'm no longer hip, slick, and cool. Now I'm a nerd, and that's okay. So go ahead. Give up your cigarettes, and give up your booze, and give up whatever you want to give up. Quit your jobs, move, buy new homes. I don't care what you do. Give up sugar, give up chocolate, but don't ever give up on yourself. Never, never, never on yourself. I guarantee you, you are a much better person than you think you are. And you have been chosen to do a job that most people can't do. And that's stay sober and to help another alcoholic. Now I'm going to tell you one quick story and I'm going to get out of here so you can go get warm. A year and a half ago, my mom died. God bless you. My mother was a spitfire, I'm telling you. She'd tell you, she'd see a nice young boy in a pair of tight pants. And she'd say, and he'd be you know, a waiter. And she, he'd, he'd come around the table and she'd say, you got a nice ass. <laughs> now, <laughs> now, <laughs> that'd be an 80-year-old woman. <laughs> She was a corker. She was a corker. I love my mother. She Maybe she didn't do it the way I wanted her to do it, but God bless her, she did it the way she could. And I honor her and respect her in her life and in her death today. But I had the honor of taking care of my mother as she was drawing her last breath. She had lung cancer. And she sat there smoking her cigarette. <laughs> and it was 4 o'clock in the morning, and my mom had to pee. And you know how we are. We don't want to pee to bed, and we don't want our pee or pants, at least when we're sober. (laughs) She laid there in bed, and 
my sister and I were there sleeping on the floor, and she woke up, and, and uh, she said, i got to go to the bathroom. And I said, Mom, I said, I, I can't lift you. Now, she was a little person, but, you know, when people, they get heavy all of a sudden. I don't know what happened. And that settled it into getting ready to go to heaven, I guess. But she, uh, I said, what I'll do is I'm going to, I'm going to lean down and you put your hands around my neck and like a crane, I'll lift you up, swing you over to the potty, you go. When you're done, I'll bring you back, okay? She's, you know, a little piped up by morphine, but she still got her senses and she said, okay, honey, we'll do that. Now, my mother was my best drinking buddy. And we were close, but we had never been this close because we were nose to nose. And I lift her up and swung her over, went to the bathroom, bring her back. And just as I'm putting her head on the pillow, and our noses are just about touching, and she looked me right in the eyes, and she says, God send me. She says, dying is so difficult. And I said, honey, I have no idea. I have no idea what you're going through. But I want you to know you're doing a hell of a job. And she says, but I'm so afraid. And I said, that's okay. It's okay to be afraid. I said, but you're going to do it anyway, aren't you? And she said, yeah, I am. She says, but how do I do this? How do I die? And I said, sweetheart, I said, when we end, we're going to go back just like how we started. So what I want you to do is I want you to roll over on your side. I want you to curl it up like you did when you were a baby. And I said, I want you to go to sleep. And I promise when you go to sleep, you'll never wake up. And she did just that. But what my mother left me with was that dying's difficult, well, so isn't life. And when I'm not willing to take my turn in the barrel, i got to take a look at what the hell's the matter with me. You know, we got it made today, folks. We're sober. we got a chance to change life. We got a chance to change the world, and most of all, we got a chance to change the life of our children and our grandparents. Our kids aren't going to have to lay in bed and wonder what's going on in the other room. So I challenge you to stay sober today. I challenge you to stand up and be the person that you can be, and that you leave this place and you make yourself a promise that you are never going to take another drink or a drug again the rest of your life. One minute at a time. Can you do it? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. And I would, I, I would love to hear from each and every one of you, and I mean that. And I invite you to go to my website, get my email address, get my phone number, get my mailing address, and let me know how you're doing. And if I can ever do anything for you, you'll let me know. Because that's what Alcoholics Anonymous is all about. It's about helping each other and asking for nothing in return. And that's what I will do for you. If you go to my website, it's a cute name. It's She's Unlimited. Is that arrogant or what? (laughs) But I would love to hear from you. And I mean that. So I want to thank you so much for letting me stand here before you. Be a part of this. The greatest show on earth today is Alcoholics Anonymous. Hug each other. Love each other. Leave here. Spread your sobriety all over like you did your drunkenness. Be a proud recovering alcoholic. There is no shame in being a drunk. The shame is being a drunk and knowing you're a drunk and doing nothing about it. You're doing something about it. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.